George Carlin is celebrating his 60th birthday and his 40th year in comedy with the publication of his latest book, a uh, collection of jokes, notions, and nonsense called Brain Dropping. After visiting with him by satellite last February, I'm pleased that George is in our studio tonight, and I say welcome back to CBS, my friend, and thanks for coming in. Thank you. We had a great deal of fun that night from Aspen. We did, and that woman is suing you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One thing I've never asked you about, we share something uh, besides May 12th is our birthday. Right. We both share a Catholic education involving nuns. Yes. And I gather yours didn't take as well as mine. No, and I had the gentle kind. We, we had an experimental school uh, with uh, uh, no report cards, no marks or really? grades of any kind. Yes. Uh, boys and girls together in the classroom. Mm -hmm. This is the 1940s. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, no corporal punishment. And uh, everything was open to discussion. The desks were movable. It wasn't with that grid thing. It was a very free and experimental school. Which is unusual for Catholic education. Yeah, Ours and, was quite strict. And it was promptly discontinued. <laughs> well, not, not really. It's, it's a great school, Corpus Christi in, in New York City. And, and the, the sisters were from Wisconsin, Cincinnati Dominicans. And the priest who, who invented this school, who, who founded it, Father mm -hmm. George B. Ford, he insisted on having these nuns who had received master's degrees in education from uh, secular institutions. He did not, not want religious, to, right? Yes, to have uh, secular masters. So did these nuns have an awareness of the world outside of the church? They, they, they yeah. certainly were a little more relaxed about life and the world. And, and they encouraged us to think for ourselves. Everything in the classroom was open to discussion, including math. You know, well, I don't believe that. Uh, it was wonderful. And there were always four or five uh, PhD candidates from uh, teachers College, Columbia University, which is right across the sure. street, in the back auditing our classes, seeing how this system worked. I grew up thinking it was normal to have adults in civilian clothing at the back of the classroom. Right, right. But, it, but when they are encouraged you to do dissent or question yeah. things, you certainly have followed their I, admonitions. I did. Yeah. And, and what, what they did was they gave me permission, in a way, to, uh, to lose the faith. They were trying to keep you in the faith, and here they said, think for yourself, and I said, well, I thought it over. <laughs> it, was, it was First Communion. And what you're telling me is not, not, not no, very good. Well, it was First Communion. They, they, everyone filled me with this idea that I was going to feel different. You get your First Communion, That's you're going right. to feel different. Didn't happen. They said, I feel the same. same yeah. So I, from there, I just I took everything they said less and less seriously. And as a kid, I've read that you were a thief. You stole stuff. Oh, we stole everything. You and, you and your buddies, all of we, you? We stole from stores. We broke into stores. We, we stole from trucks. We stole from Columbia University. We lived right next to Columbia and Juilliard and a couple of seminaries. Okay. We, we used Columbia as our playground and a training school for vandals, really. We stole typewriters, microscopes, You're everything. Kidding. We, we would have stolen an atom bomb if we could have because they built them. They didn't really build them there. But uh, Pupin Laboratories, where the Manhattan Project began, two blocks from my house, they were busy thinking up A-bombs. We'd have taken one if it You'd have been the first on your block to rule the world, right? And if they'd have left it out, we'd have had it. And did your mother and father know you were this kind of a kid? My father was gone. He was asked oh, okay. to leave early. He couldn't metabolize ethanol successfully. <laughs> and, and my mother said, your hat is over near the door. <laughs> right, <I> see ya. <laughs> actually, she, it was more dramatic than that. She actually ran away from him when I was two months old. She had, a, she had me in her arms at two months. My brother, five years old. She went out a window, down a fire escape, and through backyards into a car. Bye-bye. Yeah. yeah, he was a bully, and, and that was too bad. He was wonderful. I mean, had a great mind. Uh, she had to work all day, so I was on my own, so I stole things. She didn't know. She'd say, where'd you get the typewriter? I found it. Found it, right. Found it. Oh, well, bring it back. And did you ever get in trouble with the cops? No, it was wonderful. They never caught you? No, they weren't, they didn't care about the things like that. You know, they were more interested in, in really big crimes. And, uh, and, and in fact, we, we had nicknames for all the policemen. There was Batman, there was Holes, because he had a lot of pock marks. And uh, we regularly made fun of them and held them up to ridicule, and they sort of enjoyed it. Yeah, so you never had to talk your way out of stuff with the Oh, cops. that's all I did. Oh, yes, I, I, because well, that's why we never got arrested. Never, never encountered you. Well, it, it wasn't cops. It was Columbia guards. Oh, okay. In fact, we were responsible for, for them at Columbia finally putting big gates on the windows so you couldn't break in. <laughs> we know that security was increased solely because of us. And we, we would run from these guards, and occasionally you get caught. And as they were about to apprehend you, mm -hmm. the other guys would say, George, you do the talking. You do the talking. Because I was a little glib. I was very glib. And I would, uh, we would make up things, you know, and tell them anything. Because we knew they had no authority, basically. Right. They weren't real cops. No. They for Columbia. You know, and you just sort of say whatever. And we, one time, three guys got caught together. This is a, not apocryphal. This really happened, but I wasn't there. We had three kids in the neighborhood. There were hundreds of children. We had three children whose actual names were Johnny Brown, Bill Smith and Tommy Jones. That was really their names. You're and kidding they, they, me. they were all from 122nd. Occasionally they were together. 
They were caught by policemen in uh, sneaking into a movie, and the cop was trying to scare them. Uh, what's the name here, you know? And the first one gives his name, whichever the order was, Johnny Brown. Johnny Brown, huh? Okay, yeah, Johnny Brown. What about you? Is that Bill Smith? Ah, uh, Bill Smith. I don't know, you think I'm crazy. You know, Tommy Jones, boom, right in the head. Tommy Jones, one step too far. <laughs> you know, Anthony Pagliosi would have been fine. Fine, but not Tommy Jones. No. And what was your introduction to comedy? When were you first aware as a kid that there were people who could make folks laugh? Well, uh, that came because I was a radio child. The, what, the end of the golden age of radio. Me too, kid. Where, yeah, and it was wonderful. And I was, a, I was more or less a lonely kid because I had time on my hands. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I loved the solitude, the lack of supervision. But there's a loneliness involved, and the radio became my extended family. And the comedians always interested me. Uh, another kid upstairs had some Spike Jones records. And then going to the movies, I would see Danny Kaye, mm -hmm. Bob Hope, these, these guys who were funny in the movies. And that became my dream. I remember listening to comedy on the radio as a boy, you yeah. know, in a darkened room. Phil yeah. McGee and Molly would come on, and oh, Bob Hope would come on, yeah. and you'd laugh at these programs, Burns and Allen, yeah. Jack Benny. They were terribly funny. Terribly and there was funny. another interesting thing that happened to me. Because I didn't really have a family life, uh, I would listen to Fibber and McGee and A Date with Judy, Meet Corliss Archer, these little things set in the Midwest where they had porches, and they had an upstairs, right. and a bedroom. Henry upstairs. Aldrich. Yes, Henry. Henry, Henry Aldrich. Charming mother. mother. Ezra Stone. And, and I, I, at one time when I was about 18, 17, I guess, I was, I was leaving Denver. I was in the Air Force, and I hitchhiked home from Denver to New York. And I went through Decatur, Illinois, and Springfield, Illinois, in the late afternoon in May. This was like 5, 5.30 mm -hmm. in May. Wonderful time of the year and day. And, and I found myself with this very at-home feeling. I, for some, and here's a city kid from Manhattan. Sure, sure. And I just was so attracted and so charmed by something. I never figured it out at the time. And later I realized these were the places I heard about. These were the places on the radio. On the radio. And that right. I saw in the Andy Hardy movies or the, the different movies. And it was just this, isn't that an odd thing to, to, that that would happen to you? Yeah, it is. You it know, is. and you say, gee, this feels good and, and not know why. And, and I think it was that. It was like going home to this place I inhabited when I was seven and eight years old. Does your work ever get tiring to you? Do you ever think about no. packing it in Georgia? No. And when people ask me that, although I don't really put myself in his category, I say, well, that's like saying to Picasso, when are you going to put these brushes yeah, down, okay. Pablo, and get a real job or whatever? Or take it easy and go sailing. <laughs> it's what I do. It's how I am in the world. You know, and it is my art. So I assume some form or other. I mean, I'm happy to get to the book now. I was, for 40 years, I found I was using the least efficient means of communicating with people. I travel to where they live and talk to them. Right. right. Not efficient. This is much better. Send it out in a truck. Well, except that now, <clears throat> with the book, you have got to go to all these places, yeah. and I'm sure you've been on a tour around yeah. the country yeah, that's why to I'm promote little... this book and yeah. make people aware of it. Huh? Right. I'm, and I'm a little tired from that. Those are brutal schedules. Because in order to start at 6.30 or 7 in the morning with some radio program, you have to fly to that city the night before. Right. And there's very little chance. I love eight hours sleep. I'm, I'm one of these people, I'm never tired. I never get tired. I'm okay for a long time, mm -hmm. and then I go to sleep. Yeah. That's all there is to it. Now I'm tired. It's kind of nice. It's like, what was your day like today? What have you done today? For, today for, for I started the with uh, KABC Radio with Minyard and... Uh, Tilden. And Tilden, my friend. Yeah, my friend, Peter Tilden. And I went on from there to a, a KTLA Morning News. I went back to that same building for KLOS FM. And it's been like that, and a print interview, and another TV, and, and politically incorrect. And I'm ending it here. And if I fall asleep, fine. <laughs> You're doing remarkably well. I was going to mention this to you later. Uh, you, you know, I've seen your work, and you get on the, the, the stage or on, on the HBO specials that mm -hmm. you do, and you rant, and you rave, and you mm -hmm. knock this, and you knock that, and you swear, and you curse, and you, f and you fume. You were married to the same woman for 36 years. Mm -hmm. your, your, your daughter lives right around the corner from your house almost. Right. If, uh, you're, you're a square in, in well, your personal life. You, yeah. Um, well, my, my I mean, when we finish here tonight, you're going to go home and put your jammies on and go to bed. I'm getting on a plane to go to New York. Oh, you're kidding. Oh. But I would normally do the yeah. other. I would normally have those jammies out. Um, the thing I like about this book is that it represents all three parts of me from the stage. There's a, there's a sort of an innocence and a whimsical kind of a, I, th I think of it as a sweetness, a kind of childlike mm -hmm. wonder. That's in there. There's the anger and the stridency. Those things are represented. And then there's the English language stuff, which really I love so much. And, and those things, it's a, it's a good balance. It's a good representation yeah, yeah, of me. Yeah. We're with George Carlin. The toll-free is up and running at 1-800-952-2788. The book is called Brain Droppings, and we'll be right back after this break.
With George Carlin, here is Scott on the toll-free in Chicago. Hi, Scott. Welcome to CBS Late Night. Hi. Hi, Scott. Was, how are you? All right. Good. How are you? Pretty well, thanks. I was wondering, as have many comedians in the past, have, uh, I was wondering if you ever bombed on stage. Oh, sure. And especially in the beginning, what, the advantage you have after, after you're known and you have a following is that people come there sort of predisposed to like you because they, they already like your style. But in the beginning, it, it's, it's tough. And when you bomb and you have to ride home on the subway or something, the only thing you can do is remember the good nights. You say, this is the exception. Mm -hmm. Friday was great. These people were morons tonight. Tomorrow will be better. <laughs> and just come back and, and to the club. In those days, it was clubs for me. But when you people, comedians, go out by yourselves, and walk the high wire with just material based upon your life and observations. Yeah. It's a very, very risky thing. And, yeah. and when, it, when it goes wrong, it goes yeah. terribly wrong. Well, the thing is, you're looking for a result every 5 or 10 or 15 seconds. That's right. A singer can sing for 3 or 4 minutes and know they're going to get applause either way. But you are going to get, thing, you're going to get a response that's only spontaneous. It's not planned. And, and if, if you bomb 3 or 4 in a row, they smell that. Yeah. They might not like yeah. it. They might not be interested in seeing you humiliated, but they know it's happening. And silence in your work is not golden. No, but I found out in 1992 that you can allow some silence. I found out Good. finally, and this is why my work got better in the last six or eight years, because I discovered that your job up there is to engage their imaginations. Yep. And it's sufficient if you're doing wonderful things with words and giving them some strange ideas that aren't necessarily funny. Mm -hmm. So it was the planet thing that I did uh, in the 92 show about the planet being fine, don't worry about diapers, don't worry about plastic bags, the planet will be here, fine. you'll be gone. <laughs> That's what gave me the courage to, to do some different things, that you can have little silence. But essentially, you're right, silence is deadly. Scott, I'm glad you called, and thanks for watching our Thank program. You, Thanks a lot. And, uh, happy 52nd birthday, Tom. I know it's a little late. Okay, thanks and a million. I appreciate congratulations that. Congratulations on your 500th show. I wish you 5,000 more. Thank you, sir. See you that? You, thank you. Bye bye, Scott. Bye, bye. Thank you. You mentioned this book contains some of your anger, your love mm -hmm. for language, mm -hmm. or, or your, your, your passion for language, mm -hmm. and the things that give you wonder. What, well, what gives you wonder? Well, just like we don't ever say half a month. You know, we say. You know, a year and a half, you yeah, say a week and a half. You know, well, I get, I'm sorry, I forget how I said it now. That's, that's the trouble with writing. You don't have to memorize it. Yeah, okay, okay. But it's true. You never hear a guy say, well, I'll be, you know, let's wait about a half a month and we'll do it. You're that. right. You're right. But there, some of them are, are, are really just silly like that. Others have a little, a little depth to them. Uh, what are you in awe of in life? What, 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 what in your life have you said, wow? Well, this species being given such an obvious good mind and great gifts and wasting it on beliefs in an invisible man in the sky and the ownership of things. That's all we worry about now, is the ownership, ownership. of things. And we look, for, we look for a little relief from an invisible man who has a place of fire where he's going to send us, but he loves us. Place of fire, but he loves you, and he needs money. He always needs money. And, and it's just a sad thing, and that's why it will never be realized. This species will never be realized. I'm in awe of that, that that can happen. But we're just never going to make it. We're always going to be looking for a salad shooter. Or, or sneakers with lights in them. You know, that's our goal. Do you have a salad shooter? We have the brown one. Oh, they have a brown one. You know, that's all people care about. Salad you know. shooter is funny, you know? Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, Great word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, rolling pin's not funny. Well, but, sometimes. But salad shooter is yeah. funny. You've traveled the country now on this book tour, and you have more to do. Mm -hmm. As you travel around, what do you see that makes you nuts? What, what, what do you see in the, the, like, I remember your HBO special where you, say, you talked about one-hour photoshops, and you said, what, people, you don't remember it yeah, for well, an hour? Right, why do you need a one-hour photo finishing? You just saw the just thing saw it, right. that hasn't yeah. changed. Yeah. They haven't painted the Statue of Liberty right. since you took the picture. Uh, they don't, that's not things that make me nuts. It's just they're just fun to collect. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, waiting to get on the airplane. Okay. Uh, uh, we, airport, airport gift shops. Huh? All right, airport well, gift shops. You want to pick up a newspaper. Uh, well, on any line where people are buying things, but the, especially somewhere like that where you have a newspaper for a dollar and some gum for whatever they get for sure. that. And that's all you want. And the guy ahead of you has bought gum, and he has a credit card out. And you have to wait for this thing to be swiped and cleared and signed and everything. And you want to go to an airplane. Right, right. And, or else he has, a, he has a letter of credit from the Bank of Liechtenstein. These people who, you know, they, they can't just carry money. It's easier. Yeah, cash. It's have, yeah, or someone at these airport gift shops who's buying crockery <laughs> or clothing. Here's someone buying different. What size is Phil? Medi, hold on. Give me, wrap that. What size? Get another one, the large one. You know, I don't need that. Go to a clothing store. Right, right. Go to a crockery shop. There's a nice word. But leave me alone. Let me buy my gum and go. 
How about uh, how about restaurants around the USA as you travel? Well, my, I, I ran into a place, Top of the Schmuck. It's in Texas. It's a wonderful place. It's a 50-foot tall statue of a schmuck with a cowboy hat on, and there's a restaurant in the hat band. Restaurant in the hat band, and it was wonderful. It was working real well, but the trouble is, the hat band spun too quickly. Oh, I hate that yeah, when that and happens. And people were getting sick just waiting for a table. You can't have that. <laughs> Another place, Chili Alley. <laughs> yeah. Chili Alley, where you drive through. You can drive through. It's not slow. You drive through at speeds of up to 40 miles an hour, and they shoot the chili at you from a shotgun. $2 uh, a, a shot, three fifty both barrels. Right. Dry cleaning extra. Uh, another one, Bombs Away. Good restaurant idea. The pat patrons are on the ground floor. The kitchen is on a balcony. And when your order is done, you hold your plate, and they drop the chef drops it. Bon Appetit works wonderfully with steaks, not so good with creamed spinach. Peas were a problem. Soup was a mess. Went out of business four days. Top of the schmuck. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> What about if you're on the road, and I've, and I've been in the situation where you have to watch television mm -hmm. late at night, sometimes in the afternoon, you have a couple of hours to kill, so you go back to the hotel or motel, you turn on the TV, and the endless parade of commercials, again, as you said, yeah. we're, we're obsessed with buying things, getting yeah. things. Yeah. Well, I, I, the relief from that is that the wonderful thing is that you find, it's, someone proposed a the theory once that we watch the LOP, the Least Objectionable Program. Mm -hmm. So you click around, you go past all the infomercials, and you might actually wind up enjoying an old bonanza, you know, yeah. and sort of, and you feel a little bit almost like an archaeologist. It's yeah, wonderful. Or Colombo. Yeah. Oh, Colombo. Colombo's great. Yeah. I just yeah. love yeah. Colombo. Lady, one more thing. Yeah. Yeah. The things that I wonder about are these commercials that come on, sometimes infomercials or other times like a two-minute commercial for the definitive, definitive 50s record album with oh, yeah. all the hits from the 50s, yeah. and they use these words, not available in stores. That's right. Why not? Right, yeah. Well, wouldn't that do well in stores? No one would buy it. Oh. <laughs> That's why it's on television. It's like my video. I have a video on television. Same kind of commercial. A little better commercial, yeah, I must yeah. say. But uh, it's a 1-800 number, and for a certain amount of money, you get a certain number of things. But I'm proud of the commercial. Not available in stores. But I'm going to put out a CD called Not Available Anywhere <laughs> and sell it in stores. <laughs> here, here is Richard on the toll-free in Arlington, Virginia. Hello. Hey, Tom. How you doing? I'm doing fine, Richard. Thanks for watching. What's on your mind tonight? I hope tonight? your mom's doing well. I beg your pardon? I hope your mom is doing well. Oh, she's doing very, very well. Thanks. That's great. Uh, George? Yes, sir. Uh, one of my favorite things in the world is to see you on stage talking about politics. No one does it like you. Thank you, sir. And I'd like to ask you, uh, it seemed, I've, I've seen you over the years, all your HBO specials, and I'd like to know uh, what, your, what is your opinion of, and are you familiar with uh, things like Extra Magazine or uh, Howard Zinn or people like thinkers like Noam Chomsky, and how come we never see these people on TV? Well, people, Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky, those people aren't on TV because they have, they have intellects and they're dissenters, and the, the limits of debate in this country are set before the debate begins. These people will not be included. The debate will take place between these two polls, and we'll have them on Ted Koppel, and it's an argument between sames. I mean, it's, it's the same right. thing. It's just right. little variations. The people who are outside are quickly marginalized. They're made to be either subversive, made out to be, either subversive or kooks. This is the word. Well, in other words... He's a kook. Yeah, and also in the parlance of some television programming executives, the, the, the gentlemen that the caller mentions mm. are considered to be boring. They're uh, not, they're not uh -huh. interesting interesting enough, they're not That's motivated right. enough, and they're not dynamic enough, so therefore people will not watch them. Too many ideas. Yeah. No, da a dangerous thing. No dangerous strange thing. sex to talk about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's essentially my, my reading of it. This, this country uh, has a limited experiment in democracy. Limited. We are with George Carlin. His newest book is called Brain Droppings. The autobiography is in the works. More on that and you on the toll-free. I'm Tom, and this is CBS. In the break, George and I were talking about uh, your autobiography, which you're working on now. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have the view from another member of your family. Kelly, your daughter, will give yeah. her side of certain stories. And a number of other voices. But the key voices that, that might conflict with my version of things are, are the, the, ver uh, the versions of my wife, Brenda, and Kelly. And I thought it's, it was an interesting idea. Tony Hendra is my collaborator. Mm -hmm. Tony's an extremely talented writer and an extremely funny man who understands the comedy in America to a great degree and so he's a great person to be doing this with and he thought how can we you know what can we do here right. and we decided to you know I'm talking about what happened in the 70s when I'm full of cocaine 
And this is my version. And then Kelly says, my daughter says, oh, wait a minute, no, 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 no. That's similar to the truth. <laughs> Not quite the same <laughs> Close, way. right. Yeah. And, and so that's a kind of a, a, a novel uh, approach. Would you prefer to leave out 1965 to 1980? No. No, it's all part of the package. You have to go yeah. with that. I wish I remembered more of, let us say, 1973 through 1976. That would be helpful because there are, there are whole years. I can mark my drug use by the years when I don't know who was in the World Series, who was in the Super Bowl, and who was the president. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I, I, well, I, 73 to 74 would be Nixon. Yeah, but I mean, I know that now as a, as a, as a, as a macro fact. Okay. But at, at the time, it was like, oh, okay. And, and, I, and I, can remember, I can remember being engrossed in watching Elmer Fudd and Petunia Pig and something I... <laughs> considered to be a drama, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just so loaded. And I can remember snorting my own dandruff, you know. I mean, finding things on the tabletop, you know, the dresser top, you would look down to see where, the, where there might be some powder, and you scrape it all together, and it was like talcum and dandruff really? and stuff like, oh, yeah. Because, what was the Because you couldn't get the guys at home. He wasn't home. The what, guy, what was the attraction of it, George? It, it's, it's all electrochemical. It's all the thing with the, the, the pleasure center of the brain. It's, you know, it's not the attraction is, oh, boy, that's the attraction. You know, and, 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 and I'm anal anyway. It's wrong drug for someone who's anal and wants to sort things out. <laughs> One time, Brenda found me sorting out all the nuts and bolts and nails that I had accumulated for 20 years. Sorting she by said, size. what are you doing? And you yeah. said, I'm sorting these out. Yeah, right. and she said, fine. Where's the Coke? We would hide Coke from each other and find it months later. One time I was out on the lawn and I was actually considering washing the grass with a brush. <laughs> You know, and, each, and I looked at all, oh, all the little leaves of grass, or whatever they are, petals, you know, stems. And I, what are these things? Blades. Blades. And I thought, this is going to be too big a job. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go in and I'll sort something out. Oh, my God. And looking oh, for, looking Lord. for coke. You spill coke on a rug in a motel with a bunch of musicians, and everyone's on the ground snorting the rug. And later oh, on, geez. when you would blow your nose, you could find Dinell fibers, the color of the rug, in the Kleenex. Oh, Little red strand. What's that? Blood? No, 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 no. That's the carpet, remember? It was fun, but it was strange. I was going to say, you know, we, we did marijuana in the 70s, mm -hmm. you know, the, those of us who worked television in New York. Yeah. And I think I tried the other stuff one time. Yeah. And the next day, my nose ran all day, and yeah. I had a headache, and I said, this, this, is, not, this is not for me. It's I, probably cut with something like cement. <laughs> you have to be careful who you get this stuff from. How'd you get off? How did I get off? I, you know, oddly enough, Brenda went into a place and got, came out clean and spent 22 years clean. I just began taking things less. Everything dwindled down, even the marijuana, although I do use it from time to time to punch up something I'm writing. But the, uh, the other to, drugs... To punch up something you're writing. Yeah, I write something sober, and I read it, and then I say, punch up time, and I have one hit. <laughs> one hit is all I need, and then <laughs> doors of perception. Right, right. But, and gobs uh, of tuna. Yeah. Yes. The, the, the answer to the other question, which I've forgotten because of all the marijuana accumulation, uh, <laughs> what was I saying? It was really interesting. Uh, you were talking about uh, you, uh, you, uh, you close down. You less and less oh, and that's less right, and yeah. less. And what happened was... You're not going to trap me on I one noticed, of these questions. Yeah. I'll tell you right now, pal. What happened was I noticed, and this is a fact about the use of any drug, including alcohol, that at first the pleasure is long-lasting long and the pain is a very short price. Uh, as you continue use of the drug, the pleasure period contracts and the pain and the payment you have to make gets bigger. If you have an intellect, at some point you look at it all and you say, this is not worth it, right. I'm going to do something. So I did it in de by degrees. I just had, I took less, took it less frequently, mm -hmm. took it for longer periods, lesser periods of time, and eventually it was just gone. I, I was lucky and I was able to get off it that way without being in the tabloids. You mentioned Brenda. Yes. I, may I say to you as a friend, I mean, we don't go out socially, but I consider you a, a dear friend. Thank you. I felt so bad, George, yeah. when I read that she passed on yeah. Mother's Day. And, and I say that to you here. I, I felt so bad because I know how much you loved her. Oh, yeah. She was a powerful partner. Yeah. Uh, she was, uh, I like to say it this way because it, it makes me feel good, uh, the light of my life and the keeper of my dreams. And there was a time when we walked on the street in Chicago in the beginning and I said, do you think anybody will ever recognize me, Brenda? And she said, oh, yeah. Someday everybody's going to know your name. And uh, I'm glad that, uh, that she saw that come true and that we had such a good life together. We did have 36 years, and, and what happened to her was relatively swift. You know, that was sort of a blessing. You know how we have to look at things mm -hmm. that way and weigh them mm -hmm. up. But uh, she's a powerful force in my heart and in my mind and uh, will always be on stage with me. 
Okay, kid. Yeah. Good luck. Fly safe to New York tonight. Thank you. And I hope to see you soon. Okay, I'll okay. be back. We love you, George. It's a threat. Okay, bye bye. Okay. George Carlin is the guest. The book is called Brain Droppings Back After This Break.